Greetings and welcome to worship for this 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Well, I did it. I got a haircut, as you can see. And boy, did I get a good welcome from my barber. It was almost like uh, meeting an old friend at a high school reunion. It's been that long. Our gospel reading today is a familiar passage about welcoming. But I wonder if we actually hear what Jesus is actually saying. We'll explore that a little bit later in our sermon. But first, just a, a special welcome to all those who are joining us online or visiting with us today. It's great to have you with us. We hope you enjoy your time with us today. And I just encourage you to check out uh, our congregation a little bit more by visiting our website at gslcc.ca. So let's take a moment to prepare ourselves for worship, settle our hearts and our minds, maybe light a candle, create a little sacred space for us, and then we'll begin with our opening hymn. Let's take a moment. And then let us sing our gathering hymn, number 641, All Are Welcome.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, your Son sends us out into the world to be proclaimers of your grace. And sometimes we go, but often we don't. So come to us today. Proclaim to us your word that turns us inside out, that moves us to mission, and that reassures us of your constant and never-failing love and presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And I invite the children to gather around the screen. Hi, guys. Good to see you. Well, I'm not at the church anymore. No, I'm, I'm here at home in my office at home. Bet you didn't see that coming, huh? <laughs> Let me show you a little bit of my office. You know, there's uh, my bookcase where I keep some of my books and uh, my 
uh, music stand where I practice my violin and over here is my comfy reading chair where I read my books and uh, read my Bible every day. Yeah, and I, I won't show you my desk because, uh, well, it's kind of messy. But anyway, I'm here at home in my office because this is where I keep a picture that I wanted to show you. And this is the picture here. Do you see that? That's a picture of my mom and my dad. Now, you know, a lot of people tell me that they see my mom in me. I think what they mean by that is they think I look a lot like my mom. And so when they see me or they look at me, it kind of reminds them of my mom. A lot of people also tell me that they see a lot of my dad in me too. I think what they mean is that when I, do, when I move my hands or this way I say my words or the things I do, it, it reminds them of the way my dad does those things too. And you know what? I think, that, well, that makes me really proud <laughs> because I think my mom and my dad are pretty awesome people. And I hope that they are, I, I hope that people can see a lot of them in me. You know, we don't know what Jesus looked like. Uh, there were no cameras back when he lived, but we know what Jesus was like. We can know that by reading our Bible. But even more, Jesus tells us today that we can help others to know what he was like when we do the things he did, live the way he lived. When we do the things Jesus did, we can help others to see Jesus in us. Like, for example, when we care for somebody, well, that's a really good thing to do, right? But when we care for someone, we're not just caring for them. We're helping them to know what Jesus is like, too, because we know that Jesus cares for everybody. And, and we don't even have to do anything big and fancy. Um, Jesus says today, even if we give somebody a cup of cold water who's hot and thirsty, um, well, we know that's, that's a good way to care for people, but it's also helping them to see what Jesus is like, because Jesus cares for all our needs even when we're thirsty, right? And I think that's pretty awesome, that Jesus lets us show others what he's like when we live like him and do the things he did. So maybe we should all try to live a little bit more like Jesus so that others can see what Jesus was like in us. How about we pray about that? Okay, let's fold our hands, bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's pray. Dear God, Help us to be more like Jesus so that others see Jesus too in us. Amen. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. And now let's hear our readings. Our first reading from Jeremiah is set during the days before the final conquest of Judah by the Empire of Babylon. Through a symbolic action, Jeremiah insisted that Judah and all the surrounding nations should submit to the king of Babylon. Hananiah contradicted the word of Jeremiah, who in reply insisted that Hananiah's rosy prediction should not be believed until it came true. God confirmed the word of Jeremiah and sentenced the false prophet Hananiah to death. A reading from Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from the ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesied peace, when the word of the prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is taken from Psalm 89. We begin with the refrain. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. 
For I am persuaded that your steadfast love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor our might is exalted. Truly, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Sin is an enslaving power which motivates us to live self-serving, disobedient lives. Sin's final payoff is death. We, however, have been set free from sin's slavery to live obediently under God's grace, whose end is the free gift of eternal life. A reading from Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teachings to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us sing our gospel verse. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of the disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Diane Roth is a Lutheran pastor in Texas. 
She recalls the first time that she ever preached on this uh, gospel reading for today uh, as a rookie pastor in rural South Dakota. She worked hard that week and came up with a rousing sermon on welcoming the little ones and giving a cup of cold water even to, well, to anyone in need. And that particular week, it happened that there was a stranger in town. He was wandering around, sitting on people's porches and asking for help. And at one point, a little later in the week, Roth met a parishioner who said to her that he met this stranger and gave him a sandwich because of her sermon. Well, it was a heady moment for a young preacher, she said. I thought, people do listen to what I'm saying, at least some of the time. In fact, so flush was she with that success that it wasn't until 20 years later, she says, that she realized how narrowly she had been reading this text up until now, or up until then. Un not until then that she realized that this really isn't a text about how to be welcoming at all, but rather a text on being welcomed, about what it means to be the recipient of the welcome of others. And she wonders in her story how she ever missed that point in the first place. Well, maybe we can forgive Pastor Roth because maybe most of us have much the same uh, experience, the same history with hearing this text at least. These are the last words Jesus speaks in this missionary discourse that we've been following for the last couple of weeks. And maybe we might expect with all the harsh instructions Jesus has been giving his disciples that, well, he might end up here with a little bit of encouragement. Some talk of a reward that may, might make all this witnessing worthwhile. But he doesn't. Instead, he promises rewards to those that they will be encountering on their missionary journey. Those who will be welcoming them along the way. And like Diane Roth, maybe we can wonder why we too miss that detail so easily. Well, frankly, I don't think it's that hard to understand. The truth is I'm, I'm more comfortable being a host than a guest, aren't you? I mean, sure, it's nice to be invited over to someone's house for dinner, and I'll never turn down an invitation like that. But what if you're served something you don't really like? How awkward can that be? Or what if you're invited to bring your kids over and they end up misbehaving and embarrassing you to no end? No, I'd, I'd much rather be a host where I can be sure that the food I'm serving is exactly to my liking and that I can, well, confine my kids to the, to the basement with a pizza and a couple of movies, or at least I used to be able to. It's much more comfortable to be a host than a guest. And so it is in our church life, too. We gravitate to books and resources and seminars about how to be a more welcoming church. It's what we've placed so much emphasis on in the last couple of decades, at least as the Lutheran Church, and, and for a very good reason. Being welcoming, practicing good hospitality is critical to a church's mission, to a church's well-being, to a church's future, and there's no question about that. But being welcoming is also safe and comfortable. Being the host lets us stay in control, right? Helps us to set the rules, helps us to keep things familiar. And above all else, being the host allows us to stay inside. To stay inside our building and wait for those others to come to us so we can lavish them with our expert hospitality and our excellent welcome. Maybe it's not confusing at all why we hear these words the way we do so often. Given a choice, we love to be the welcoming insiders. But what do you do when that's no longer an option? How do you be God's people when you can no longer be the welcomers? How do we be church 
when we can no longer be in church. That's exactly what this pandemic has foisted on us, right? These past few months have been a, a dislocating experience for many of us in so many ways. Maybe small, but significant ways. We've experienced what it's like to go to the grocery store and not have access to some of the most basic stables of modern life. We've experienced family separation. Some of us have even had to rely on temporary government support, maybe, to make ends meet for the first time in our lives. And most directly to our point today, we've been locked out of our churches. Locked out in a way that maybe, maybe gives us just even a little bit of a taste what it's like to be an outsider instead of an insider. This pandemic has forced us to feel what it's like to have the proverbial shoe on the other foot. And it's opened us, opened us up to questions we've never had to ask before. How do we be God's people when we can no longer be the welcomers? Well, maybe we learn to be better guests. And maybe we learn that being a disciple is more about being welcomed than we ever realized before. That being a disciple, for one, is about getting out of our building and understanding that ministry, too, happens in all the daily interactions we have in our families, in our workplaces, and in our neighborhoods. Maybe that's why Jesus sends these disciples out on the road in the first place, right? That they might learn that discipleship isn't just what happens when they huddle with Jesus in their little cohort, but that it's lived out in the world around them, in their contact with those around them, and in the context of all the ordinary experiences and relationships that they have around them. Maybe we learn for another thing, that being a disciple means sometimes coming alongside others, working with others, instead of always doing for others. That sometimes it's about giving up control, giving away our advantage, letting go of our power to control the agenda of our encounters with others. Maybe, maybe that's why Jesus instructs these disciples that whenever they enter a town, they are to find out who is worthy and stay with them until they leave and then move on. Because being a disciple is about having our eyes and our ears open to how God is at work in so many places and ways around us. And it's about joining with those who are up to God's work in the world, whether they know it or not. And maybe we learn for a final thing, that there are rewards in being a guest. Rewards we rarely take notice of. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, Jesus says. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. You know, a lot of scholarly ink has been spilled over the years about what those rewards really are that Jesus was referring to. But to me, it kind of comes down to one word, community. To receive a guest, to truly welcome that guest, is to receive the company and the friendship of that guest. It's to enter into the human community created by that encounter and into the spiritual community created by that encounter. For whoever welcomes you welcomes me, Jesus says. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. In other words, to be a disciple is to be one who doesn't just welcome others into their community, but creates community wherever they go. Who gives others the opportunity to welcome them. And in the process allows new friendship, new relationship, new community to take root and grow. It's to be someone who serves as a catalyst for new community to happen, or even just adds a little richness to an already existing community. And it's to be one who in the process can bear the presence of Christ to 
to a place where it's never been known before, who can bring the light of Christ to someone who's never seen it before, who can give others the opportunity to welcome Jesus. How do we be the church when we can no longer be the welcomers? We get comfortable with being out, out of our building. We keep our eyes and our ears open to what God is up to all around us and to the opportunity to join in with that work. And we bring with us the gift of friendship, the gift of community, and a vision of the kingdom of heaven. And what might that look like? Well, way back in February, I told you the story of a, a couple who are members at Lutheran Church of the Cross in Victoria, Anne and John. They live in the uh, Cobble Hill neighborhood, um, which is about 45 minutes north of Victoria. And they're learning about living missionally, as um, many of us are. And as a result of that learning, they became involved in a local neighborhood organization called the Cobble Hill Events Society, which last year decided to put on a series of summer music concerts in a local neighborhood park. Well, being in Cobble Hill, <laughs> those activities happened way outside John and Ann's church building. But these two folks saw something good going on and started to wonder whether God was up to something. So they applied for mission funding from the BC Synod, not to advertise their church at the event or to fly the Lutheran flag, but just some support so that the event could actually happen or the concerts could actually happen. And, well, the money was granted, and the events were a success. Sometime later, though, John was talking to another member of the Events Society who had learned that the Lutheran Church had provided some funding. And the member asked John, what's, what's a church doing funding this? What, what's in it for them? Are they trying to start a new church in the neighborhood? And John just simply replied, no, our church just likes to be where the community is. The member looked a little quizzical at John, but then smiled and said, cool. That couple came alongside others who were doing God's good work around them. They joined in. They were welcomed. They enriched that experience with their presence. They brought the gift of themselves and their friendship and some finances. And they even opened the eyes of another to the vision of a God of grace and unconditional generosity. How do we be the church when we can't be in church? Keep your eyes and ears open. Listen to what good work God might be inviting and welcoming you into. And then with the courage of Jeremiah and the confidence of Paul, take up that invitation. Share whatever gift you've been given. Don't forget that you bear the presence of Jesus wherever you go. And be the light of Christ in that place. And in all the world. So let it be. Amen. We sing our hymn of the day, number 779, Amazing Grace, which is our uh, favorite hymn request for today.
called into unity and friendship with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our world, singing. God of faithfulness, how is it that your church is so often enslaved to fear and uncertainty when you have blessed it with your holy and empowering spirit? Guide our feet, clear our vision, strengthen our hearts, and open our eyes to the opportunities for mission around us everywhere that don't depend on us being in this building. Bless the congregations of our B.C. Synod, and especially today, Faith Lutheran Church in Kelowna and their, their pastor, Brian Crucial, and Gloria Day Lutheran Church in North Vancouver and their interim pastor, Vida Yogelis. God of steadfast love, our hearts were troubled for your creation yet again this week at the news of the record heat wave in the Arctic. Protect our planet, Lord from the carbon dioxide being released from the thawing permafrost and inspire us to keep the conversation around climate justice alive in the face of such frightening developments. Lord, in your mercy. God of mercy, give insight and understanding to those who lead and direct the police forces of our country. Where change and reform are necessary in their organizations, make that happen. And help us as a country to find better ways to deal with those in crisis who need more than just the intervention of the police. God of righteousness, Heal the racism that is being brought to light in so many ways among us today. Help fruitful dialogue and conversation to arise out of the protests and demonstrations. And teach us all to overcome fear with hope, to meet hate with love, and to welcome one another as we would welcome you. God of care, be with all who are in deepest need. Renew the spirits of all who call on you. Move leaders everywhere to follow policies to contain the virus and comfort those who are sick, lonely, afraid, or in distress. Especially we pray today for Rick, Susan, Elaine, Gail, Alicia, Dawn, Jean, Sharma, Lori, Robert, Vivian, and all those others we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy. God of community, thank you for our congregation. Help us to keep our eyes and ears open 
to the ways that you are inviting and welcoming us into the work you are up to all around us. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. And God of glory, we give you thanks for all the ways you have filled our cups of blessing to overflowing. Especially we thank you for all those blessings we name before you now. Help us to sing of your steadfast love and generosity every day, Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray along with um, some members of our youth group as we pray the prayer our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, For the, kingdom the power, the power and, the and the glory are yours. Are yours. Now, now and now forever. And forever. Amen. 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 May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also you. Let us share the peace. And then let us enjoy some more abundant life photos. Let us pray in thanksgiving for all the offerings we've received this week. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Receive these blessings we return to you in thanksgiving, and inspire us to live in ways that reflect your generosity and justice. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Amen. Now receive the blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. We sing our sending hymn number 719, where cross the crowded ways of life.
Now go in peace, care for your neighbor, serve the Lord.